Hello, I'm Simon Bradbury from Plymouth University, and today I'm joined by John Selman from Plymouth City Council and Gary Jackson, Managing Director of Space Strategy. And what we'd like to talk about is a collaborative project that's been running for about the last year and a half. Um, initially started as a student project when Gary approached us and said, I've got this fantastic new piece of software that's really going to help your students understand light in the context of buildings. And of course, one of the challenges with architecture students is it's quite difficult for them to engage with maths, as many of our building physics colleagues will know. And this piece of software was absolutely amazing in translating what's actually quite a complex exercise into something that's visually stimulating and exciting um, and able for them to really design their buildings very quickly in the context of daylight. Um, now, of course, light relates not just to daylight and good daylight within buildings, but also to energy. And there's two aspects of what we're going to talk about. First of all is some research we did looking at daylight, and the second aspect is then understanding how this might be implemented in policy in the context of energy, and that's what Jonathan's going to talk about. So we had a shared ambition. We wanted to understand uh, daylight and energy in the context of housing in the UK, how we could develop policy tools to improve the current condition in the UK, and finally, how we can support education, a sort of three-pronged approach. Um, the current policy to context for daylight, which is the first aspect I'll talk about, is that there is no regulation uh, in the UK, so that's fairly straightforward. You can see from this quote in the recent housing standards consultation completed last year that essentially the market will be sufficiently incentivized to deliver adequate daylight within homes. Um, so my students and I thought we'd take this to task and we sent them off with this uh, piece of software and we asked them to analyze about 900 uh, homes across the UK that had won national housing awards for the quality of their design, um, which we thought was a good <coughs> starting point. And we asked them to look at a range of different uh, aspects, one of which was the average daylight factor, um, which there is guidance for, but there's no mandatory criteria. And looking across all of those projects, what we found was less than 50% of those projects, which are the, obviously the, the best design quality in the UK over the last few years, managed to meet the minimum standards for uh, average daylight factor across all the spaces in the units. And you'll notice Project 5 does quite well that's a retrofit of an existing Victorian terraced uh, uh, housing scheme. And if we were to take that out, we would have significantly worse results. So inspired by uh, these, these results in the context of daylight, we were really interested in how we might take this forward in the context of both policy and uh, developing better <coughs> educational tools. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Gary. Natural light. Uh, daylight, sunlight and solar gain. I'm an advocate for it and I'm an architect. There's a currently growing evidence base that suggests that talking that, that health and energy, uh, there are health and energetic wins. So should natural light be involved in our evidence base? Artistically, uh, committees, communities and clients are convinced by diagrams. We wrote a piece of software that puts data in the hands of designers and the CIOB thought it was quite a good scheme. So here you've got an analysis that we've done with, with the BRE data dotted and uh, trillions of light rays proving an equivocal result. So we could have done this in, in 1991. I had all the acetates, but it was impossible to juggle them. Um, I had the book. We've done the rocket science, and research like uh, the IIR research today that we're talking about today actually helps change minds. Let me describe the process in an office. 50% design, 50% specialist consultant, and then 50% getting it right. So we've taken, with uh, leading practices in, in London and, and Brighton where I am, we've taken this to an epic win. We've taken six weeks and got it down to two days. Um, so I want, to, I want to balance the training that Simon's talking about and the research that we're doing with the policy that uh, John's progressing. Now Simon took his students explain the basis of daylight design, and 45 minutes later, their schemes had improved and they were designing with this. This is about taking something out of the bottom drawer uh, and also watershedding in computing design. 
We cannot condemn people to live in semi-darkness away from daylight. It happens a lot. Um, getting the roads in the wrong place with less solar access creates irrevocable health and energy losses and also turns power stations on because people have to turn their lights on. We also have to recognise the Maginot line or the force field between the planning acts and the building acts. And uh, a lot of conversations with building technologists assume that these two marry together, which in reality they rarely do. So in blue here we've got uh, what we've been doing so far, which is sticking solar power on the top of roofs. Actually, this research is in, from Germany, 1991. They didn't find North Sea oil, so they had to find another way of doing it. Orientation, building compactness is having an effect. And none of this, good master planning or bad solar master planning, is not re represented in the UK carbon plan. There's no imperative to get it right. Um, <coughs> I started doing this in a barrister-led scheme. This is Bath Western Riverside, back 1990. We couldn't make a step without the barrister saying we could do it. It was a very difficult site. If we could do it in 1991 and we now have the computing technology, I think policy should change. And with that, I hand over to John. Moving on to policy, uh, what is the role of planning in this agenda, uh, particularly focusing on, on energy? The National Planning Policy Framework uh, very clearly gives a hook it talks about the role of building orientation, layout uh, and massing uh, to minimise energy consumption. That's a starting point. And the planning portal actually goes on to say this can be achieved through passive solar design. Um, and it even says that layout and building orientation are, are, are key to maximise this benefit. So we've got a clear distinction between building regs and the role of planning. Building regs, fabric are going to be uh, improved through future improvements to building regs. In terms of planning, it's a one opportunity to influence the layout and optimise it for, so, for solar orientation. So the benefits are multiple, as well as energy efficiency and carbon savings. It also has uh, major daylight uh, benefits as well, at the same time. So uh, how are we moving this approach forward in Plymouth? Um, anyone who knows anything about sort of planning policy knows that a new planning policy needs to be underpinned by good evidence base. So we commissioned Gary uh, and co to produce a report, uh, a solar optimization report that's been published uh, using three th theoretical case studies in Plymouth to demonstrate the benefits. Um, and we were clear from this um, report uh, that you know, there were clear benefits in terms of energy savings, uh, in terms of carbon, uh, potentially. And we've moved on to a draft uh, Plymouth Plan. Plymouth Plan is the new uh, planning document, but also bring together a range of other strategies. Um, draft document, a, a Plymouth Plan policy, uh, which refers to using solar master planning, but also giving a clear metric, which is vertical sky component. It's still a draft policy, and it's been out to consultation. Uh, the consultation is ongoing. So next steps. Have we got the policy uh, draft policy wording right? Is the vertical sky component the right metric to use? Um, we're still reviewing that. Uh, we're trying to get explore f further case studies with sympathetic developers. Uh, we're trying to work with. Uh, we need to take the policy through an examination, which would like to be early next year. Uh, so the planning spectrate, um, and we're moving on to working with the university. So just to sum up now, ongoing work as a, as a collaboration really uh, has a, a number of different strands. The first one is to develop training for students and practitioners because you recognise there's a deficit in uh, skills and knowledge both within uh, our students but also more widely in practice. So we're looking at online training and CPD courses that could facilitate that. We're supporting the testing of policy options and undertaking research through live case studies. Um, and finally, we're trying to disseminate those results both locally and nationally. So the, this will, Plymouth will be the first uh, local authority to try and deliver such a policy. Um, and looking to the future, it's about trying to find further partners and, and, and wider impact from what we're doing. So thank you very much.